स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया हेलो एवरीबॉडी आई एम डॉक्टर आर विजय लक्ष्मी अ मॉलिकुलर ऑनकोलॉजिस्ट फ्रॉम कैंसर इंस्टीट्यूट अडे आर वी आर गोइंग टू बी डूइंग अ कोर्स ऑन प्रसिशन ऑनकोलॉजी एंड टूडेज टॉपिक इज गोइंग टू बी ट्यूमर माइक्रो एनविरोनमेंट आई हैव गिवन माई कॉन्टैक्ट ई मेल हियर सो हु एवर इज हैविंग एनी डाउट और एनी सजेशंस कैन राइट टू मी रीच आउट टू मी थ्रू दिस ई मेल आई डी सो लेट स्टार्ट द टॉपिक so this lecture is going to be divided into two parts part 1 and part 2 in part 1 we will be dealing with what is tumor microenvironment what are the components of tumor microenvironment how tumor microenvironment interacts with the tumor how the tumor progression is dependent upon the tumor microenvironment at the end of the lecture of today you will be able to understand these topics and as a part of part 2 we will be covering how this tumor microenvironment can be therapeutically targeted so let's get into the topic tumor microenvironment is the environment around the tumor it's as simple as that which includes surrounding blood vessels immune cells fibroblasts signaling molecules and extracellular matrix now if you see the cartoon here i have shown a house and around the house what is it that you see you see a fence you see a garden you see some flowers so this fence garden and flowers is similar to the tumor microenvironment where the house itself is like a tumor cancers have very complex ecosystem which comprise of different cell types and non cellular factors so this tumor microenvironment is otherwise called as the tumor stroma this tumor stroma is a critical component of tumor microenvironment and it has got very crucial roles to play in tumor initiation progression and metastasis now take a look at the tumor microenvironment shown here so you have the orange cells here are the malignant cells the gray ones here that i am showing you is the necrotic and the hypoxic cell and then you have the tumor associated neutrophils the dendritic cells the tumor associated macrophages the myelot derived stromal cells so these three the dendritic cell the tumor associated macrophages and the myeloid derived stromal cells come under the category of myeloid cells and then you also have lymphoid cells the lymphocytes that is the t lymphocyte the b lymphocyte the nk cells they all come under the category of lymphocytes and then you have in addition to these cells you have the cancer associated fibroblasts and they are the cafs and the mesenchymal stem cells which can leach into the blood circulation so if you see a tumor microenvironment is comprising of all these cells and then there is a lot of interaction which is happening between the tumor cells and the other cells other non malignant cells which are present in this microenvironment and that is what we are going to be understanding in today's lecture this tumor microenvironment is very important for the cancer progression and they help in immune evasion tumor escape hypoxia and acidosis this we will be seeing in today's lecture and the metabolic exchange invasion and metastasis which is kind of paved way by the tumor microenvironment the concept of angiogenesis and tumor growth how these things are happening in tumor microenvironment is what we will be seeing in today's class so as we saw in the previous slide when the cancer has to uh you know dislocate from its primary location and travel to a different site and this aspect of cancer is called as the metastasis and that is what makes this disease very lethal so when the cancer cells get into the circulation 
and when they travel to a distant site they require what is called as the uh, microvasculature that is they need new blood vessels through which these cells can commute to a different site in the body so the tumor microenvironment is basically the site of this microvasculature there are several cells present here you have the endothelial cells the pericytes the angioblasts the endothelial progenitor cells fibroblasts mesenchymal stem cells or stromal cells and other stromal elements all these cells form the tumor microenvironment and then these cells will be secreting certain growth factors and certain chemicals which are called as the pro inflammatory cytokines so the pro inflammatory leukocytes which are uh, the immune cells the lymphocytes the tumor associated macrophages they are all kinds of cells kinds of leukocytes kinds of wbcs which release a certain pro inflammatory cytokines that is they will cause inflammation so all this surrounding the extracellular matrix form the mechanical scaffold so the whole thing is like a mechanical scaffold and that will define the tumor elasticity so the cancer progression involves the tissue elasticity and this is very dynamic and it keeps changing through time the tumor cells metastasize through the leaky tumor vasculature and they migrate through the blood vessels to the other organs and this is what we call as the metastasis disruption therapy may break down the physical barrier that is the extracellular matrix mechanical scaffold leading to imbalance of the cancer ecosystem so whenever we treat a cancer cell through any kind of a modulation any kind of either chemotherapy or radiation what exactly happens is this is going to cause an imbalance in the cancer ecosystem so this is stephen paget in the year 1889 came up with the hypothesis which is called as the seed and soil hypothesis that is tumor genesis cancer progression and metastasis they are all strongly dictated by cell autonomous genetic and epigenetic changes that is the tumor cells as such will be having a lot of mutations which is going to make them autonomous they will stop responding to the growth factors and growth factor signals basically they will stop responding to that and they function in an autonomous way but the tumor stroma interactions are the ones which is very important for a sustained progression of cancer the cell may have its own mutations but then for a particular cancer to progress in a sustainable way there has to be very successful tumor and stromal interactions happening this is what is called as the seed and soil hypothesis so stephen paget suggested that when a plant goes to seed its seeds are carried in all directions but they can only live and grow if they fall on a congenial soil the soil has to be in a way that it is going to uh, help in the growth of the seeds so while many researchers have been studying the seeds meaning the tumor cells the properties of the soil that is what he means is the tumor microenvironment may reveal valuable insights into the metastatic peculiarities of cancer cases paget's hypothesis is staying true to this day paget's description of the ability of cancer cells so they are your seeds to grow only in certain secondary sites depending upon their microenvironment or the soil still remains accurate that is when the cancer dislocates from a primary location and gets metastasized and moves to a different site that site the decision of you know moving to a particular site is dependent upon a very congenial tumor microenvironment in that site which can support the growth of this migrated cancer cells now this is a non malignant tissue that you see here so these are the epithelial cells which are very nicely orderly arranged and you have the cell adhesion junction which are intact and this is your basement membrane and all this 
component below the basement membrane is the stroma or the tumor microenvironment and as I mentioned there are several kinds of cells shown here. So the non-malignant epithelial tissue is supported by a stroma. So what you see here is a stroma and it is composed of the extracellular matrix. So what you see this pink one here the, the background is basically your extracellular matrix and then you have the fibroblasts here and then you have the mesenchymal stromal cells and if it is going to be a bone tissue then you will have osteoblasts and if it is going to be a cartilage then it will be chondrocytes. So the tumor microenvironment's composition also will change depending upon the organs. So the cells in the non-malignant stroma will be normally in a quiescent state that is they are perfectly balanced and they have a kind of homeostasis in the ECM that is in the extracellular matrix and the epithelial compartment if you see everything is very very orderly and the extra proliferation or extra motility or invasion is negatively regulated. So therefore the whole thing is under balance and control whereas this is what happens in a tumor situation. Now if you in case of a tumor you see that the basement membrane is breached and the tumor cells are getting into the stromal component. They are invading deeper and you can see some stromal cells coming, some tumor cells coming into the stromal uh, region here. So when cancer develops, the stroma undergoes vast changes to become fibrotic and activated. So the extracellular matrix becomes denser and more rigid. There is a lot of change which happens in the tumor microenvironment when the cancer is starting. So the extracellular matrix becomes denser and more rigid and it is composed of alternative forms of connective tissues like tennyson and fibronectin. So these are some of the connective tissue proteins that will be com coming up and this will help in the cancer cells to invade through the stroma. So and the fibroblasts and the mesenchymal stromal cells will change their shape and they will also change their expression profiles in a way that they become more proliferative and they secrete higher levels of growth factors like cytokines and chemokines. So you see that the fibroblasts and the mesenchymal stromal cells are undergoing a lot of changes in a way to support malignancy when the uh, malignancy actually starts. So the stromal fibroblasts in the tumor microenvironment are referred to as the cancer associated fibroblasts. That is what we call as CAFs or the myofibroblasts. So once the stromal fibroblasts is getting converted to cancer associated fibroblasts, then the kind of cytokines and the kind of uh, uh, chemokines that will be secreted by them will promote tumor formation. The tumor trauma promotes cancer progression and metastasis and leads to resistance to therapy and disease recurrence. That is why the tumor stroma is very very important in cancer therapy. Now the tumor stage basically depends upon the stromal activation that is what we are seeing. Now as I mentioned this is a normal epithelium and this is a pre-malignant dysplasia and this is a scenario of uh, carcinoma that is uh, when the carcinoma is starting you know so what actually happens is the stroma becomes reactive in nature. Now we will look at this little more closely. Now what you see here these are your keratinocytes and these are your basement membrane and this is your stroma. So you have the collagen bundles, you have limited number of fibroblasts and then you have the capillaries that is your uh, you know through which the blood supply is there. You have the granulocytes and the monocytes and macrophages. So they are all limited in number and they are in the state of equilibrium. But then in the pre-malignant stage when the epithelial cells start proliferating this is what we call as the hypoplastic epithelium. So the stroma when the epithelial cells are growing in numbers this happens because the differentiation program in the epithelial cells get altered and because of this there is an, a lot of proliferation that we see in the epithelium. 
This rapid proliferation in the epithelium leads to activation of stroma and this leads to activated fibroblasts. So, the fibroblasts which were in the quiescent state now get activated. These activated fibroblasts are very important to promote tumor. So, what happens is when these activated fibroblasts are going to be secreting pro-inflammatory cytokines and there is a lot more changes which, will, which is happening which we will be discussing subsequently, the stroma kind of becomes reactive in nature. When the stroma is reactive, you can see that there is a rapid proliferation of lot of cells. You are having a lot of uh, you know, neoangiogenesis happening that is new blood capillaries are formed here and then you have lot of the immune cells which are you know dividing and then there is a lot of pro-inflammatory cytokines being released. There is a breach in the uh, basement membrane and then you are having the cells kind of coming invading into the stroma. So therefore, the stage of the tumor basically depends upon how much the stroma has got activated. So let's go into components of the tumor microenvironment and their functions in little more in detail. We will be looking at the individual components. So first thing that is endothelial cells. Now what these endothelial cells do? The endothelial cells provide nutrients for tumor growth and they constitute roots for metastatic dissemination through angiogenesis and they contribute to resistance to chemotherapies and radiation. So these endothelial cells are important for blood vessel formation through which these tumor cells can travel through those new blood vessels to a distant site. So therefore, they are going to uh, be uh, you know, supporting metastasis and they also contribute to resistance. Through, for, through chemotherapy and radiation when the treatment is given, there is a concept of radiation and chemo resistance which takes place to endothelial cells are important. Pericytes also contribute to angiogenesis and they confer resistance to anti-angiogenic therapy. So, the next type of cells that you see in the tumor environment is adipocytes. The adipocytes support cancer mainly through secretion of growth factors and cytokines and they have also been shown to have role in resistance to chemotherapy, radiotherapy, hormone therapy and other targeted therapies. Immune cells influence pro-tumorigenic phenotypes that is where you, what there is something called as the epithelial to mesenchymal transition we call this EMT. So, we will be seeing that shortly. So, this is a kind of conversion into a pro-tumorigenic phenotype. So, it gets into an EMT. It, it kind of from epithelial type of a cell, it gets converted into a mesenchymal type of a cell. That's what is EMT and then angiogenesis. Angiogenesis means forming new blood vessels and therapy resistance as well as anti-tumor phenotypes for immune surveillance through diverse and complex mechanisms. So, the immune cells can be pro-tumorigenic or anti-tumorigenic and both kind of phenotypes will be seen and there has to be a balance between the two. So, if you are having an excess of pro-tumorigenic phenotype, then it is more towards cancer promotion. And then the extracellular matrix which provides structure and support for the cellular components in the extracellular space of tissues and organs and they contribute to paracrine cellular signaling. Now, if you see here, this is an example of the extracellular matrix. So, the extracellular matrix basically comprises of interactions of fibrous molecules, then you have the proteoglycans and then glycoproteins, glycosaminoglycans and other macromolecules. So, if you see here, you have the fibronectin here. And then in this fibronectin, you are having the proteoglycan complex. So, this proteoglycan complex consists of, this is a polysaccharide backbone. Along with it, you are having proteins and carbohydrates putting put together. And this is your collagen fibers. And then you also have, this is the plasma membrane. And you have the integrins for interactions. And there are also microfilaments of the cytoskeleton. So, therefore, 
uh, the extracellular matrix basically has two main compartments the basement membrane so this is your basement membrane and the interstitial ecm so the ecm is slowly and constantly degraded by enzymes such as collagenases and matrix metalloproteinases so when the ecm gets degraded the cells can start moving from their location and they can enter into the circulation so the cells have to basically breach into the stroma and they have to travel through the stroma and reach the blood vessels and then they have to get into the blood vessels and start moving so therefore for this particular process you need certain enzymes which can degrade your extracellular matrix and so matrix metalloproteinases are chiefly involved in degradation of the extracellular matrix and collagen is the most abundant protein in the interstitial extracellular matrix and apart from collagens you have elastin fibronectin tenacin and laminin all these proteins have critical roles in within this uh, compartment of ecm so we will see one after the other so one of the uh, you know most important player is fibroblast now in this particular section here you see something which is very spindle shaped in a in a fusiform kind of a structure so these are your fibroblasts so fibroblasts are very important and what you see here these are your keratinocytes and this border like thing that you see is your basement membrane so this is just a histopathological section to show you the connective tissue part so you have the collagen fibers eosinophils and fibroblasts seen here the fibroblasts build the extracellular matrix by secreting collagens and other fibrous macromolecules which also degrade this network by releasing these proteolytic enzymes which i mentioned that is the matrix metalloproteinases which enables increased cell mobility through the extracellular matrix the interaction between the fibroblasts and the extracellular matrix or the surrounding cells is mediated by the integrin signaling so you have the integrin receptors through which these interactions happen the tissue wounds or certain pathological conditions can activate fibroblasts so we saw in the previous slide that how a quiescent fibroblast gets activated during a, a process of transformation or even in the process of wound healing so anything which is disturbing the equilibrium first thing will be activation of fibroblasts so fibroblasts gets activated in such a way that they proliferate and secrete higher levels of protein in an aberrant way fibroblasts also have an important role in tissue maintenance and homeostasis by expressing enzymes from the cytochrome cytochrome p450 family which degrades the foreign and the potentially toxic molecules so fibroblasts can recruit and regulate the leukocyte infiltration and inflammation via secretion of cytokines chemokines and growth factors so fibroblasts can uh, secrete a whole lot of these chemicals which can be pro tumorigenic now this this is how a fibroblast looks this is a normal fibroblast and what you see here is the activated fibroblast so you see that there is a a uh, kind of a change in the shape here now as such if you see this is a fibroblast you have a nucleus here and then this is the integrin uh, receptor here through which the interaction happens with the um, with the ecm basically and then you have within the fibroblast uh, you know you have the fibronectin the fibrillar ecm the collagens are present here and this is the you have the actin fibers and you have the vimentin here inside so the normal fibroblasts are embedded within the fibrillar extracellular matrix of connective tissue which is largely consisting of type 1 collagen and fibronectin so basically a normal fibroblast will have type 1 collagen and fibronectin now what happens if it gets activated when it gets activated that is when it assumes or acquires an activated phenotype then it is associated with an increased proliferative capacity so once it's get activated it can undergo a lot of proliferation and it also has an enhanced secretion of the ecm proteins such as the type 1 collagen tenacin c and fibronectin as i mentioned 
the when you have an excess of this tenacin C and fibronectin in the ECM, then it actually helps the cells to invade very easily. So therefore, the fibroblasts which are activated will start proliferating and will start increasing the secretion of these ECM proteins such as the type 1 collagen, the tenacin C and the fibronectin and that contains an extra domain which is called as the EDA fibronectin and also a protein called as PARC which is secreted protein acidic and rich in cysteine. So, these are some of the proteins secreted by fibroblasts which enhances the uh, migration of these tumor cells into the stromal area. Apart from the fibroblasts, you have the mesenchymal stromal cells. So, they are basically multipotent uh, stromal cells which are commonly referred as mesenchymal stem cells. So, they can very easily enter into the circulation. Now, the mesenchymal cells, uh, stem cells are cells that are able to adhere to plastic surfaces and they have the capacity to differentiate into osteoblasts, chondrocytes or adipocytes in culture. Because the stem cells, they can get differentiated into any kind of a cell based on the tissue of origin. If it is bone, it will be osteoblasts. If it is cartilage, it will be chondrocytes. And they can express the cell surface marker CD73, CD90 and CD105, but not any of the leukocyte markers. So, these CD73, CD90 and CD105 expressing cells are your mesenchymal stem cells and they can be identified by flow cytometry if you kind of use these kind of antibodies for these markers. So, then the next type of cells is osteoblasts. Osteoblasts are unique stromal cells which are responsible for building the bone and it is a very highly uh, specialized extracellular matrix consisting of a mixture of collagen and non-collagenous proteins that is subsequently calcified with hydroxyapatite because in case of bone there is a, it is a completely a strong uh, organ isn't it so therefore there is a lot of calcification which happens with hydroxyapatite and you have a combination of collagen and non-collagenous proteins in case of chondrocytes chondrocytes is also differentiated from the mesenchymal stem cells and they are a major stromal component and chondrocytes produce cartilage, the specialized ECM which is present in the joints and other cartilaginous tissues. So, this is how the ECM composition changes based on the organ. So, this is a normal connective tissue. So, here we see the different types of ECM based upon the different types of organs. So, this is a connective tissue. So, you see that this connective tissue, the main function is connection, support and nourishment. So, the ECM favors these activities and then this is cartilage. In case of cartilage, it is more for mechanical support, for viscoelasticity and lubrication. So, therefore, there is more number of aggregants, there is more number of hyaline and then you have elastins which will give you the elasticity of a cartilage. So, the, the point is the ECM composition will vary as per the organ. So, this is in bone. Now, if you see in bone, you will have more of hydroxyapatite, then you have osteocalcin. So, these uh, are more, they give the tissue more durability, strength, a stiff structure and low elasticity in case of bone. And in case of cornea, it has to be uh, more transparent, more translucent. So, you see that uh, the, the corneal um, ECM is kind of composing of the, the corneal stroma and then you have uh, uh, the collagens, lesser number of collagens. Then you have certain laminins, integrins. So, the, the constitution is kind of uh, in a way which favors the function of the organ. Now, um, this is where uh, I am going to be showing the similarity between wound healing and transformation and malignancy. So, in case of a wound, now what you see here is whenever there is a wound, in the first case of first phase of wound healing, you see that uh, you have the activated fibroblasts and a lot of immune cells are also getting activated. So, all these activated cells are traveling to the site of the wound. 
Now in the second phase, when there is proliferation taking place, you see that the new blood vessels are being formed and these new blood vessels will increase the blood supply or more oxygenation into the area to facilitate healing. And then when this happens, then there is a lot of remodeling of the wound healing happens where you have the more number of uh, you know blood vessels being formed and then there is a lot of fibrosis which happens here more number of fibroblasts and then you have more number of uh, collagen deposition in this area which tends to lead to remodeling of this wound. Now in case of cancer something similar only happens. Now in case of the first step Whenever there is an injury or whenever there is a breach into the area of basement membrane is what is considered as injury, then you have the recruitment of the fibroblast to the tumor site. Then after that, the next stage is the neovascularization. Neo means new, vascularization means formation of blood vessels. So you have the neovascularization where the new cells are getting into the circulation. You will have the blood supply increasing to the area of injury or area of transformation which will facilitate the it actually is getting converted into a pro-tumorigenic environment and then when that is completely pro-tumorigenic and after the cells are completely breached into the basement membrane they are breaching into the stroma eventually they the the breached tumor cells enter into the circulation and then through the circulation they reach the lymph node. So therefore this is what is metastasis. So the, the formation of cancer and the concept of wound healing have a lot of similarities. Now this is what is seen in case of transformation of a normal breast tissue to an advanced invasive ductal carcinoma. Now what happens in a normal breast tissue? So you see that the basement membrane is intact and then the, this is the ductal epithelium. So this ductal epithelium and the underlying myoepithelial cells, they are all separated by the basement membrane and from the surrounding connective tissue. So there is a proper demarcation between the, the cells and the tumor microenvironment and then it is a kind of there is a basement membrane surrounding the connective tissue by fibrillar extracellular matrix, the capillaries and the fibroblasts. Now they are all very orderly. Now what happens in case of ductal carcinoma in situ that is DCIS where the in situ means within the tissue it is still not breached into the basement membrane but there is a cancer formation which has got initiated. So in case of DCIS the lumen here the here what you see the blue cells they are the carcinoma cells they have started proliferating and there is a proliferation of the transformed epithelia. So therefore you see that now once this is happening then all these fibroblasts have become activated and so you have an increased number of fibroblasts and then increased number of blood vessels as well which will start you know supporting these this plastic cell to grow further and then during the invasive ductal carcinoma you see that there is a breach of the basement membrane and these cancer cells have entered into the basement membrane that is through the basement membrane they are entering into the stroma. So there is a breach of the epithelial uh, epithelium here and this is what is called as the invasive ductal epithelial cells into the stroma. So again you see that the uh, the caps are there and then the blood vessels are also increased in number. But then in case of an advanced cancer what happens here it is only one cell but then you see that the all the other cells in the vicinity has also got transformed and then there is a breach of basement membrane. In case of advanced breast carcinoma you have irregularness and cords of cancer cells that invade the dense and the fibrous stroma. So this is how the tumor microenvironment keeps changing as the process of transformation happens from normal breast tissue to reaching a stage of advanced invasive ductal carcinoma. So now let us look at the stroma and the tumor interactions and how the tumor promoting activities of stroma happen. Now as I mentioned 
through the increased deposition of collagens type 1 and 3 and de novo expression of tenacin C, they can induce an altered extracellular matrix microenvironment, the ECM microenvironment, which potentially provides additional oncogenic signals, probably leading to accelerated cancer progression. The fibroblasts here mediate an inflammatory response by secreting chemokines such as monocyte chemotactic protein 1, interleukin such as IL-1. So, this activated cancer fibroblasts can release a lot of growth factors. So, here we it is shown releasing TGF beta, this is HGF hepatocyte growth factor, then you have the VEGF which will help a vascular endothelial growth factor which will help in uh, neoangiogenesis forming new blood vessels, then it can produce the matrix metalloproteinases which can degrade the matrix and then interleukins and all the other cytokines which will be pro-inflammatory that is increasing the inflammation in the area as well as tenacin C which can help the cancer cells to migrate or to move to dislodge from their location and migrate into the uh, stroma. So, all this is done by the cancer fibroblasts. The fibroblasts interact with the microvasculature by secreting the matrix metalloproteinases and the vascular endothelial growth factor. Fibroblasts also provide potentially oncogenic signals such as the TGF beta. TGF beta is a very important protumorigenic growth factor and the hepatocyte growth factor to the resident epithelia here and which can directly stimulate the cancer cell proliferation and invasion secreting growth factors such as TGF beta and stromal cell derived factor SDF1. So, if you see here the tumor promoting activities of stroma are multidimensional. On one aspect the fibroblast recruitment is what we saw, how it can help in ECM production, it can increase in ECM production and then on other side, it can cause macrophage polarization. That is the macrophages are attracted to the site of tumors and then that can in turn lead to increased angiogenesis and also a lot of ECM remodeling. And then there is also ECM degradation and intravasation through secretion of several protein, proteolytic enzymes or the matrix metalloproteinases which can help in ECM degradation. On the other side, they also carry out immune suppression that is using your myeloid derived suppressor cell and then you have what is called as the T regulatory cells. So, these are also getting attracted to the site of tumor and they can in turn inhibit the B and the T cell response and they are suppressing the immunity in a way that the tumors are able to suppress the immune system against activation to avoid elimination. So, they are able to function in a multidimensional way. On one aspect, they recruit the fibroblasts and then they recruit the macrophages and then they suppress the immune system and also produce enzymes for ECM regradation and intravasation. So, the whole system is hijacked by the tumor. The tumor in turn hijacks the entire tumor microenvironment in its favor to facilitate its progress. Similarly, in the earlier stages, if the tumor is in the earlier stage, it is also possible to reverse the tumor phenotype by stromal normalization. So, one has to see that the tum tumor, uh, the stromal homeostasis is not lost. So, if we can normalize that, then a reversion is possible. So, suppose you have a situation of a reactive tumor stroma that as we saw earlier, so you are having the these are all your blood vessels, then you have the VEGF receptor and these are all the proteases. So, if you can treat with a say an anti-angiogenic agent, so that can actually stop the blood supply and when the blood supply to the area is curtailed, then the stroma can become normalized or it can come back to its original form and therefore, the stroma becomes normalized and from your, you know, from your carcinoma stage, it is becoming like a pre-malignant dysplasia. So, this is when you are able to target the tumor microenvironment with, with proper agents, you know. Uh, so, like your anti-angiogenesis agents, then it is possible 
to restore the homeostasis in the stroma. Now let us look at what kind of crosstalk happens between the tumor cells and the activated stromal surroundings. So one aspect is now this is your tumor cell. So it will have autocrine signaling that is it will release certain growth factors which can influence the cell itself which is secreting it that is called as autocrine. So through autocrine mechanism there can be uh, secretion of proteases and inhibitors, ECM molecules and growth factors. So they can act on the tumor cell and then it can also have a paracrine mechanism where this particular tumor cell is influencing the neighboring cell. So here that is paracrine to the tumor. So again you can have secretion of growth factors, you can have proteases, uh, secretion of ECM molecules, activation of peptides, cryptic factors which can in turn lead to proliferation and invasion. So apart from acting on uh, you know the neighboring tumor cells it can also be paracrine to the stroma that is the, the tumor cell can influence the stroma which is just next to it as well. That is also by secretion of growth factors by secreting proteases and ECM molecules. Now this in turn when it is going to the tumor cell is going to influence the stroma then that will lead to angiogenesis, new blood vessel formation. So this is what is shown here. You have the endothelial cell which is a blood vessel. You have the pericyte and then you are they are producing certain kind of growth factors here. So which is leading to new blood vessel formation. Similarly, it can also lead to recruitment, proliferation and differentiation on, of inflammatory cells, pro-inflammatory uh, cells which can increase the inflammation in that area. Plus the tumor cell can also secrete certain factors which will activate the fibroblasts and we just now saw uh, what activated fibroblasts can do. So the fibroblasts when it gets activated it will lead to mobilization of growth factors and biologically active ECM fragments by proteases and this in turn can help the tumor cell again to proliferate. So the whole thing happens in a form of a, in a cyclic way and there is a lot of simultaneous crosstalk which happens continuously between the tumor cells and the activated stromal surroundings which decide on the, the aggression of a particular cancer. So uh, this, this particular cartoon shows what is necrotic, what is hypoxic and what is, what is normoxic region within a tumor. Now, as we saw that when there are new blood vessels formed and the blood supply to that area is going to be high that means that is an oxygen rich area. So that area is called as the normoxic region within a tumor and then deeper into the tumor you will have an area where the oxygen cannot reach. So that is called as the uh, hypoxic region where the oxygen concentration will be low and then Beyond that, there is again another area which is called as the necrotic area where the cells are dying because of lack of oxygen, the cells are already dying. So within a tumor, you have the normoxic, the hypoxic and the necrotic region and the hypoxic region here is very, very important for, uh, you know, a pro-tumorigenic pro environment. Now what happens in case of hypoxic area when you have a hypoxic uh, region within a tumor that uh, leads to production of a two of a growth I mean of a particular protein which is called as the HIF1 alpha. Hypoxia inducible factor 1 alpha. You have the HIF1 alpha and HIF1 beta. There are two types of proteins. So this HIF1 alpha will get induced and that can in turn lead to formation of certain cytokines which in turn can lead to a proliferation of a lot of uh, you know genes. It will lead to transcription of lot of genes which are important for metastasis and invasion. All these are induced by this HIF1 alpha. So this HIF1 alpha plays a very very important role in metastasis and this leads to increased tumor vasculature. Again, when uh, uh, kind of treatments like radiation is given uh, to a bulky tumor, that also can uh, create hypoxic regions within tumors and that in turn can, you know, induce the HIF1 alpha. 
So the HIP1 alpha's expression is generally more uh, favoring tumor vasculature. So therefore, one has to take care of this HIP1 alpha uh, protein and then uh, the relative amount of stroma and its composition may vary considerably from tumor to tumor but they do not correlate with the degree of, of the tumor malignancy. So normally every tumor to tumor there will be a difference uh, in the amount of stromal component present but the interactive signaling between tumor and stroma is very important and it contributes to the formation of complex multicellular organ. The cancer cells themselves can alter the adjacent stroma to form a permissive and supportive environment for tumor progression. So that's what the cancer cells do. They kind of alter the adjacent stroma in a way that is permissive and supportive for their own growth. Now, how do the cancer cells do that? The cancer cells usually go about generating a very supportive microenvironment by producing stromal modulating growth factors. There are several stromal modulating growth factors which support cancers, cancer growth and these include the basic fibroblast growth factor, members of the vascular endothelial growth factor, the VEGF and the platelet derived growth factor which is PDGF, epidermal growth factor receptor EGFR, ligands that is EGF and interleukins colony stimulating factor CSF and transforming growth factor beta and others. So, there are several growth factors which are uh, produced by cancer cells and then each one of them have a mechanism to uh, kind of generate a supportive microenvironment for the growth of cancers. But to make things simple, we will just focus on TGF beta to see how the activity of TGF beta helps in tumor growth. Now, the TGF beta signaling promotes fibrosis and progression by the EMT. EMT is epithelial to mesenchymal transition in different organs. Now, what you see here, this is basically an epithelial cell. So, you can see there is a tight junction there. The cells are placed in a particular apical order. So, you have the basal uh, uh, side and the apical side and all these cells are adhered to each other with the help of these junctions. Now, what happens when there is an epithelial to mesenchymal transition? You are having a, a cell which is uh, stationarily placed in one place assumes a motile form that is uh, in a way it is getting transformed in a, in a, into a particular kind of phenotype which will favor its movement from one place to another place. So, that is the epithelial to mesenchymal. As a mesenchymal phenotype, the cell can start moving. So, it actually assumes a, a spindle kind of a shape and it, so that it can start moving into the circulation. And epithelial uh, to mesenchymal transition is basically not just in cancer. It is uh, a normal process in the body uh, during embryonic development, during wound healing, uh, cancer metastasis and fibrosis. So, this is a kind of a, a phenomenon which normally occurs in the body. But in case of cancer, as I mentioned, the whole process is very similar to that of wound healing. There is EMT which happens, which helps the cells to metastasize. So, uh, during the EMT, you are having the uh, certain, uh, you know, genes like snail, twist, zeb. These are the genes which will promote EMT. That is, they are converting the epithelial uh, phenotype to a mesenchymal phenotype. And uh, as a part of cell signaling, you have several uh, growth factors like TGF beta, FGF, EGF, HGF. All these growth factors help in the process of EMT. Similarly, you can also have mesenchymal to epithelial transition that is also possible. But uh, when the cancers have to dislodge themselves and get into the circulation and move forward, the EMT has to happen. And this important aspect of EMT is promoted by TGF beta. So, uh, the epithelial cells lose their original properties such as the apical basal polarity, cell-cell adhesion and they acquire a mesenchymal feature such as the anterior and posterior polarity and then uh, a cytoskeleton that favors migration and invasion. So, uh, as epithelial cells, they are stationarily put in one, uh, one particular area 
but when they assume um, a motile form that is uh, a mesenchymal phenotype then that is favoring migration and invasion the expression of epithelial markers like e cadherin e cadherin is a standard epithelial marker and vimentin is a standard mesenchymal marker so normally during emt the e cadherin gene expression is suppressed and vimentin expression is increased so you will have e cadherin gene expression suppressed and expression of mesenchymal markers like n cadherin alpha sma that is smooth muscle actin fibronectin and vimentin all this is induced so in any early cancers or in any kind of a dysplasia situation when you have these mesenchymal markers being highly expressed then that could be an indication that the cancer is actually formed that is it's invading or it is the the process of transformation has begun so some of these mesenchymal markers can be uh, you know can be helpful in early detection of cancers now this is a, a kind of shows the uh, role of tgf beta in hepatocellular carcinoma so what you see here this is a tumor cell so this tumor cell is producing tgf beta and this tgf beta itself will act in an uh, in an autocrine way it will stimulate the tumor cell here and this tumor tgf beta will also lead to uh, proliferation of cells and also leading to formation of new blood vessels here so tgf beta is helping to increase the angiogenesis and then so it will can increase the proliferation it can decrease the apoptosis it can increase the emt and it can increase the invasion and metastasis so all these things are uh, you know carried out by tgf beta so at the cellular level tgf beta is inducing proliferation and survival of the hcc cells displaying a late tgf beta signature promoting emt invasion and metastasis at the micro environment level E tgf beta is basically a key mediator of angiogenesis in hepatocellular carcinoma contributing to a high vascularization of these tumors so tgf beta also generates a favorable immune micro environment for tumor growth so this is how uh, uh, an important growth factor uh, of an ecm can promote tumor growth so this is another example of um, how tgf beta and hif hif1 alpha kind of come together so i have already mentioned about hif1 alpha in the previous slide so what you see here is a now normoxic region like how we saw earlier this is a blood vessel so you have the normoxic region here that means the oxygen concentration is normal here and then you have the hypoxic region where the oxygen concentration is low and then you have the necrotic region where the cells are dying now in this kind of a scenario in the normoxic region what happens is there is a particular protein called as the von hippel lindau protein vhl this is a tumor suppressor protein and this is a um, it's a ubiquitin ligase so when that concentration of oxygen is normal the vhl is because it's a ligase it can degrade it binds to hif1 alpha and leads to its proteasomal degradation and this proteasomal degradation can happen only in the normal concentration of oxygen now what happens in the hypoxic situation because the um, the oxygen concentration is low or in a situation when the vhl protein is faulty or it's mutated as a tumor suppressor then this in the hypox or in the hypoxic uh, uh, situation this hif1 alpha gets stabilized so if you have a situation where the hif1 alpha is getting stabilized and that can lead to activation of several targets which will facilitate tumor progression like the hif1 alpha and the beta will bind to the uh, the hif1 binding regions within the dna and they can lead to transcription of several genes which are involved in angiogenesis in invasion and metastasis in emt for uh, in case of survival and metastasis and then for genomic instability for metabolic reprogramming for de differentiation for altering the immune response so many things are play are happening because of the stabilization of hif1 alpha so the as i said hif1 alpha stabilization can happen because of hypoxia but then it is also possible to have uh, an increased hif1 alpha because of tgf beta now 
here that is what is shown here fibrosis occurs in several organs as an outcome of wound healing following a recurrent tissue injury now it is defined by the dysregulated production and excessive accumulation of collagen rich ecm as well as replacement of the normal functional tissue with a fibrotic tissue this is what we see in a oral premalignant condition called as oral submucous fibrosis where we have an excess fibrosis in the oral area so whenever there is a tissue injury which happens and uh, even initiation of cancer is considered as a tissue injury you have an excess of fibrosis and when you have excess of fibrosis it is mediated by tgf beta and hypoxia and tgf beta signaling synergize in the regulation of fibrosis tgf beta signaling promotes activation of fibroblasts and remodeling of the ecm so generally the local resident fibroblasts will differentiate into the myofibroblasts or the cancer associated fibroblasts that express the alpha smooth muscle actin so the alpha smooth muscle actin is a marker for cancer associated fibroblasts or myofibroblasts type 1 collagen fibronectin and other ecm components so the fibroblasts will be differentiating into all this that is myofibroblast type 1 collagen fibronectin and other ecm components and the tgf beta induced expression of another protein called as the lox l4p which is basically a lysyl oxidase like protein it contributes significantly to type 1 collagen cross linking which is increasing the uh, the collagen production in that particular area so the tgf beta and the hypoxia induced the lox l2p expression promotes collagen cross linking leading to ecm remodeling and leading to fibrosis and metastasis so that is what they have shown uh, in renal cell carcinoma that is in kidney cancer progression so you are having tgf beta tgf beta binding to the tgf beta receptor 1 and this in turn is activating the hif1 alpha and this hif1 alpha can be activated by hypoxia as well so both tgf beta and hypoxia hypoxia can induce the hif1 alpha and there is a synergy between tgf beta and hypoxia which can lead to linear, uh, renal cell uh, progression renal cell cancer progression so the synergy between tgf beta and hypoxia will increase a lot of gene expression like vegf leading to uh, growth factor uh, you know vascular endothelial growth factor which means there is more number of blood vessels glut1 then uh, this is uh, carbonic anhydrase 9 all this is uh, increased due to tgf beta and this will in turn play a role in tumor progression and metastasis so if you see tgf beta is such an important player uh, in several cancers and these are all the genes and proteins which are increased in response to tgf beta like in case of kidney cancer you have an over expression of ca9 glut1 and vegf and uh, then all these are important like ca9 is carbonic anhydrase 9 for ph control glut1 is important for glucose transport and then vegf is important for angiogenesis similarly uh, in case of in case of pancreatic cancer you have fibulin 5 pkc alpha nestin nox4 so these are important for emt and protection from apoptosis so kidney cancer prostate cancer pancreatic cancer lung cancer liver cancer gastric cancer colorectal cancer breast cancer all these cancers have a collective involvement of tgf beta uh, you know promoting uh, invasion and metastasis on these are all the selected genes uh, and in different forms of cancer which is regulated there is a synergistic cooperation between tgf beta and hypoxia which promotes invasion and metastasis of these cancers so this is an example uh, to show that this is a pancreatic uh, adenocarcinoma cells now this is a tumor environment so you can see that how this pdax cells are kind of contained within the tumor micro environment and uh, you have all the cells that i mentioned important cells like you have the tgf beta and then you have the mic macrophages the monocytes the cancer associated fibroblasts then you have the antigen presenting happening the b cells and the t cells recruited now you have the myofibroelastic caps in the inflammatory caps all these are present what i'm trying to show here is if we are able to block any of these interactions 
which are happening through certain drugs and agents then it is possible to stabilize this particular tumor micro environment and that is what we will be covering in detail in the next class so summarizing the key points tumors comprise cancer cells as well as stromal compartment with cellular and non cellular components the tumor stroma has critical role in cancer development progression and metastasis typically anti cancer therapies predominantly target the cancer cells and their effect on tumor stroma is not taken into account but it is important to have a means to target the tumor environment to facilitate cure so therefore the tumor response the tumor stroma responds to anti cancer therapies by inducing therapeutic resistance which can ultimately lead to fatal disease so it is not sufficient to just address the cancer cells but it is important to address the tumor micro environment the anti cancer therapies should target both the cancer cells and the stromal compartment to be effective and result in improve in improved patient outcomes i will repeat this sentence the anti cancer therapies should target both cancer cells and stromal compartment to be effective and result in improved patient outcomes tumor progression has been recognized as the product of an evolving crosstalk between different tumor different cell types within the tumor and the surrounding supporting tissue or the tumor stroma that is what we saw what amount of crosstalk happens between the tumor cells and the adjacent cells in the tumor micro environment genetically abnormal cells define the tumor compartment itself the surrounding and the interwoven stroma provides the connective tissue framework for the tumor tissue so the take home messages are cancer cells can alter their adjacent stroma to form a permissive and supportive environment for tumor progression and this is known as the reactive tumor stroma cancer cells produce a range of growth factors and proteases that modify their stromal environment these factors can disrupt the normal tissue homeostasis and act in a paracrine manner to induce angiogenesis and inflammation as well as activation of the surrounding stromal tissues the cell types such as the fibroblasts the smooth muscle cells the adipocytes leading to secretion of additional growth factors and proteases activated fibroblasts in the stroma produce tumor progression by secreting growth factors and the pro uh, stimulatory migratory extracellular matrix components as well as upregulating the expression of serin proteases and matrix metalloproteases that degrade and remodel the ecm the induction of inflammation in the tumor stroma also results in production of a range of factors that produce tumor progression in a way these are promoting tumor progression angiogenesis promotes not only the tumor growth but also progression from a premalignant stage to a malignant stage or to an invasive tumor phenotype so this neo angiogenesis is a very important area of therapeutic targeting the tumor stroma can have a more direct role in tumor genesis and by acting as a mutagen by normalizing the tumor stroma it is possible to slow or to reverse tumor progression so with these take home messages we will conclude today's session and in the next session we will see how this tumor microenvironment can be targeted through different agents thank you